It is a pleasure to welcome you back to the annual Marilyn Smith Women Inspire program, honoring Smith alumni Margot Thomas and Audrea Wasson. Please note, this event is being recorded and the video will be posted to the Women Inspire website when it is finalized. If you have questions, please write them down for the Q&A portion, which will be after the discussion with our honorees. My name is Mark Forrest, and I'm the Program Director of Alumni Relations at the Robert H. Smith School of Business. We have a good crowd this evening. Thank you all for joining us. Um, this evening, as we continue to showcase Maryland Smith's fearless alumni leaders excelling in business. I'd like to recognize our past honorees who are in attendance. If you can please stand when I call your name. Margarita Chang, 2017 honoree. and Kristen Welch, 2013 honoree, who I believe is on her way with um, right now. So now I'd like to introduce our next speaker. As Dean of the Robert H. Smith School of Business, Private Dave Kanana leads the school's mission to promote research excellence and an inclusive learning environment and equip leaders to assess complex, complex problems and deliver innovative solutions. He is a recipient of the NSF Career Award, an accomplished researcher with several best paper awards into the value of social networks in IT, and an outstanding teacher with numerous teaching awards. Please welcome Dean Prabhu Dave Kanana. Thank you, Mark, and good evening, everyone. It turns out I have to focus only on this side, the other side is empty. Um, and I really want to welcome you all to a great evening today for a Women Inspire event. And more importantly, meeting in person, seeing you in face, face to face, is an entirely different experience. So it's so wonderful to see you all, and thanks for taking time to come here to celebrate something very profound and inspiring two women today we have today. Um, I'm Prabhudev Kunana, the Dean of the Smith School of Business. I'm happy to be here with all of you. There are lots of students, our alums, our faculty and staff. Tonight is special for us to celebrate and honor two Smith alumni as part of the Women's History Month, so it's the right time, at the Smith School of Business. Before we begin our panel discussions, I would like to offer a brief update of Maryland Smith. Since I came here, before I came here, I knew about this school. It has some incredible talent, and actually if you walk by the alumni on the a uh, lot of the pictures that you have, the alums, there are some incredible people there. They have transformed this world. And we have some of the most spectacular faculty members in the world. Our school has 18 faculty members in the top 2%. Most schools feel great if they have one or two. So this is a place where there's intellectual capital. The students who come in are some of the best and the brightest in the world. Now, we have done so many things in the last one year, despite the pandemic. We have now launched, and we have the first batch going to come in soon, the Integrated Living and Learning Business Honors Program to compete among the best in the world. It's also a way to attract the best and the brightest in the country. Along with that, we're also launching a Smith Business Leadership Fellows to be competing with, again, the best honors program in the nation. And looking at the profile of students who applied, I'm confident we'll be in the top five in a few years. Our online MBA program has been ranked very high, it's number 12. And there's many subcategories. We are ranked number one for marketing, number four for finance, number six for analytics and general management, number seven for veterans. We are very proud of our accomplishment and a lot of it is reflected in how our students do. And I always keep saying, we are as good as our alum, alumni. The better they do, we look good. The executive education program is expanding, and I just got a number that we went from 300,000 to 1 million in the last few months. We have a new professional certificate program in data science and analytics. We have just launched blockchain business imperative program, the first open enrollment uh, executive education, actually which made money for us. And new graduate certificate in technology management, we are starting in fall 2022. And that can be taken on its own as a certificate or can also be part of your Flex MBA program. You can learn more and take advantage of these programs by visiting the Smith School online. I have to say this, or it is a dereliction of my duties. 
I encourage you to consider your next investment in Smith for us so that we excel in what we do and we inspire many more students like we are seeing today with Women Inspired. Please join us in supporting these initiatives and many more on Giving Day next Wednesday, March 9th. One of the ideas of this Giving Day is not so much about the money itself, it's the participation of the alumni with us. Just to give one data point, there are lots of private school, business school with 95% alumni engagement rate. We are in single digit. So the purpose of the Giving Day is not more so much of the money, is to bring the alumni and connect with us. The more you are connected, the more we can achieve in the school. So today we're going to honor uh, uh, two outstanding women. And before doing that, I would like to introduce Dr. Nicole Coomber. And uh, she's going to introduce the speakers more in details. We have Dr. Margot Thomas, class of 1990 here. Dr. Thomas is the founder and CEO of the Women's Economic Imperative. Definitely need a uh, round of applause for all the accomplishments you have done. And Audrey Awasong, uh, who received her Bachelor of Science in Marketing in 2018. And Audrey is the founder and CEO of Nobel Uprising, Inc. To be frank, after graduating three years later, I did nothing. So uh, it's, you, you are truly inspiring uh, what you accomplished. Thank you, Margot and Audrey, for your commitment and dedication to the Smith community and the world. It is now my pleasure to introduce Nicole Coomber, our moderator this evening. Nicole is the Assistant Dean of the Full-Time MBA Program and Associate Clinical Professor in Management Organization, which I believe the title will change soon, right? Um, and I've seen Nicole, uh, when, they, when they use the word bundle of energy, uh, you can put uh, an exponential on top of it. And she is there in every event, everywhere, wherever I go in a school event, there's one common person there, that is Nicole. Thank you for all your work you're doing. She is teaching, uh, she teaches management, leadership and consulting. She dedicated to helping women manage their complex lives more effectively through her research and coaching. Nicole's writing has appeared in Washington Post, Forbes, Insights with Impact. She is the author of Management and Interactive Approach, a Principles of Management textbook available through Pearson Education. That's a good plug in to buy that book. She has a PhD in Education Policy and Leadership from the University of Maryland. And she's a proud mom of four lovely boys under the age of 11. And yesterday they were on the campus and they were wearing the t-shirt. What was that? The, the feminist, the fe I'm a feminist too. That was there on the t-shirt. I'll now turn, turn it over to you, Nicole, for an outstanding evening. Thank you all for attending. Thank you so much, Dean Kanana. So first, before I read the kind of formal introduction, um, I just want to say that both of our honorees tonight really, they don't just talk the talk, they also walk the walk. And when I've read over what they've done and I met with them a few weeks ago, I'm just so impressed with the impact that both of them have made. And so it's, it's going to be a really great opportunity to hear from them and learn from them this evening. Um, Margot Thomas um, has a PhD. She is an MS graduate from 1990 from the University of Maryland. Uh, I guess it wasn't maybe the Smith School then or just become the Smith School? It still was the Smith School? When did, when did it start? No? 96? All right. 98, all right, we have some debate. We'll, we'll have a history lesson later. Uh, she's a thought leader and catalyst for inclusive economic growth, focusing on private sector development, business ecosystems, entrepreneurship, and competitiveness. Uh, her current role is founder and president of the Women's Economic Imperative, as Dean Kanana mentioned. And Dr. Thomas serves as a catalyst for initiatives aimed at increasing opportunities for the economic empowerment of disadvantaged and underrepresented groups globally. So, Dr. Thomas, if you can come to the stage. Okay. You have to forgive us. This has been, it's been two years since we've done this, and so we're all a little like, oh, what do we, where do we sit? Um, our second honoree is Audrey Awesome, also known as Audrey Awesome. <laughs> She's a uh, 2018 graduate, as Dean Kanana mentioned. 
Um, and she's the founder and CEO of Noble Uprising, a 501c3 nonprofit organization that serves, educates, and empowers women to overcome hardship through socially responsible programs and resources necessary to enhance their overall quality of life. She is an anti-poverty advocate, and Audrey has pioneered various initiatives that provide essential resources to women, and we're gonna learn more about that in talking to her tonight. So Audrey, if you can come to the stage, please. So we're gonna start with a question um, about just the career journey and how Smith, the, the Smith School of Business has helped kind of contribute to that journey. What are some of the things that you learned here? Um, so tell us about your career journey and how did Marilyn Smith contribute to that journey? And um, Margo, we'll start with you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I do wanna start by saying how, that I'm honored to be part of this and to be able to connect and to contribute. In terms of my journey um, as a professional, I had the privilege of working most of my career um, in the World Bank, which is a global organization, development organization. I joined in my late teens. I was 19 years old. I started as a research assistant. But I like to say I grew up in that organization. It, it, in many respects, it, it shaped the arc of my career. I came to Smith after I completed my undergraduate. And I came to Smith because I was looking to develop skills to solve a problem. I was part of a unit supporting the executive of the International Finance Corporation in managing budgets, programs, and people. And at that time, we didn't have the kind of off-the-shelf business processing and business management information systems. So when I came to Smith, I was really looking for the tools to help me better deliver for my executive, but also for the units within the International Finance Corporation, which is part of the World Man Group that I serve. How did that influence my career? I didn't continue along that specific career path, but it certainly informed my approach to managing people, to managing programs, recognizing that being able to manipulate and mobilize data to inform decisions was a critical, it came at a critical juncture for me, and that is something that I've taken forward with me in the way in which I've dealt with governments as an advisor to governments in helping to build organizations in new economies. Um, I helped to um, build capacity and to establish investment promotion agencies in at least 12 developing economies in different parts of the world. Um, and being able to build those systems up from the ground up the skills that I learned, for example, going into Mongolia just after it became an independent republic and working with people who had, not, who had not been part of market systems, but they were trying to very quickly acquire the skills to enable them to attract investment from uh, market economies. And that entailed helping to build some of those very systems that Smith helped me to be able to do, at least from, if not strictly from a technical perspective, but in terms of building conceptual frameworks and understanding how that is done. So for me, um, I, Smith had a lasting impact on my career. I like to say that it influenced the arc of my career because I was able to bring these skills together even though my focus really was on competitiveness, public policy, um, but it was very much foundational for me. That's great. Um, it's interesting because our curriculum still focuses so much on that data-driven you, you know, way of making decisions. Um, and it's just interesting to hear that through line, right, of what we still continue to teach and what we hear from our students. Audrey, what about you? How did um, being at Marilyn Smith influence your career? Well, it had a lot of influence over my career, and thank you so much for being here today. Um, in terms of, if you asked me in high school what my biggest fear was, I would tell you public speaking. 
<laughs> and here I am today. And so um, it, it had a lot of influence on who I am today. And let me just give you um, a bit of background. So I was fortunate enough to be around individuals who were problem solvers. They were go-getters and ambitious. And they always encouraged me to be uncomfortable and put me in uncomfortable situations that And the CEO ended up becoming my mentor, and we had to go to trade shows. And we, for this instance, we went to a motorcycle trade show. And what was interesting is, like, what, I was 16 years old, and I had to sell motorcycle insurance to individuals who had motorcycles. And I was terrified, <laughs> very terrified. And, um, but I had to be confident enough that he put me in those situations to help me grow and help my people skills. And so I say all that to say that um, I was grateful to be around such individuals and when faced with you know, why individuals are going through the traumatic experiences that they're going through through homelessness, poverty, I decided to do something about it. Um, and number one, the trade show helped me with my people skills. So it helped me ask more questions, ask why more, right? And as a result of that, I created what is now Noble Uprising. And in terms of the impact of the University of Maryland, I remember one of the, um, I was speaking at some event, I was invited to speak at an event from Maryland, I think it was like the Capital Campaign. And typically when I accept speaking engagements, I'm always like, why did I agree to this? On my way to the stage, because I get so nervous. But I remember speaking um, at that event and I remember saying, at the University of Maryland is a place where pursuits like this, like what we're doing at Noble Uprising, where pursuits like this are not only possible, but they're inevitable. And that's so true, right? Our, my time at Maryland, participating in programs like the Dingman Center of Entrepreneurship, I started from, you know, when Noble was just an idea, Spark, which was like the ideation um, two-day week that they had, um, to taking the classes and doing Terp Startup and um, participating in the Southern Management Leadership Program, helping me refine and develop my business idea to even my professors. My professors were really important. My business law professor, he couldn't really give me business, he couldn't give me advi like legal advice, but I would be like, so our articles of incorporations look like this. And he'll be like, well, what I would do is. <laughs> and so it helped me develop a lot as a leader and put me in situations that helped me grow and develop um, develop as a leader and develop self and of course my friends as well. And so it had a, a very profound impact on, on my journey and my career. Mike, so my <laughs> laughter or whatever doesn't, doesn't get picked up. Um, World Bank at 19, selling motorcycle insurance at 16. <laughs> like this is, these are some incredible honorees, y'all. <laughs> um, so I want to turn to thinking about setbacks. We all have experienced career setbacks. Um, I'd love to hear about one setback you experienced and, and how you overcame it, and then any advice, because you know we're looking at current students, recent alums, they're gonna experience these things as well. So Audrey, we'll start with you. Um, what's, the, what's a career setback you've experienced, and what advice would you give the folks sitting out here today? Yeah, I've had a couple, um, but I'll say just two. <laughs> the first one is, as a young entrepreneur, um, I would say one of my biggest setbacks is allowing my age to impact the level of confidence that I have in a room. And um, I used to always say, you know, in these rooms with a lot of individuals with great experience and they have so much more things to say and so much more to offer. And I allowed that to kind of diminish my voice. Um, however, over the time, over the years, I've learned that being young, I have a fresh perspective, right, that I can bring to the conversation. And not only that, but um, individuals who may be more seasoned and set in their ways may not consider. And so I have learned to um, value, even if it's the most elementary um, idea that I have, being confident in that, in that um, and learning to master self as well, right? Like in terms of um, what I say to myself, <laughs> 
filtering that, right? I, I would say what you say to yourself determines the level of success you have because you might be your biggest enemy or your biggest cheerleader. Um, and so there's that. And the second was learning to be an effective manager. So I am a visionary and I follow the EOS model, the entrepreneurial operating system. And there's a visionary and there's an integrator. The integrator is more boots in the ground, whereas the visionary is more like in 10 years, what are we doing? And I'm more of that. And I don't know, like I didn't know how to manage people. And I had, I took a little survey with my employees and I asked them, I thought I was a, a um, I thought I was a, a democratic leader. And I took a survey and I could have 100% believed that I was a democratic leader. And they all thought I was authoritarian. <laughs> and I was shocked. <laughs> I was shocked. Um, and one of our core values at Noble is called the Noble Experience. We're focusing on ensuring that everyone who encounters Noble, they feel loved, heard, valued, and respected. And that means the same for our employees as well. And so with, with that, taking that feedback back and, and learning, I did a whole retreat individual with myself, and I wanted to ensure that I was being the type of manager and the type of leader that they were receptive to and they would open open to, um, and they, they could trust, right? Because people buy into the leader before they buy into the vision. And so we want to make sure that, um, that, uh, that I have that under, under the rug. So those are a few of my setbacks. This, this woman come teach my leadership class. It, it, it's true, though, that humility to recognize and not say, oh, you're wrong. I'm definitely <laughs> democratic, right? That humility is really important. Like, no, people actually are hungry for your opinion. Margo, what about you for setbacks that you've experienced? Well, I think they take different forms, but one that I thought was worth sharing with our audience today. Um, very early in my career, I, um, I, I worked in the bank, started as a, as a research assistant with short-term contracts. And I got to a point where in order to fulfill some of the obligations that I had, um, I decided I needed a full-time job. And so I applied for a position that I felt at least I can get that job as a full-time full person. Um, but it wasn't commensurate with my qualifications or where I was. Um, and I got a call from somebody in the HR department who said to me, I see that you've applied for this job, but this is not for you. You need to be patient. You need to find the right opportunity. My big takeaway from that, especially for young professionals and for women in particular, is don't settle. That was the big learning I had. Um, I, it also made me appreciate the fact that when you are trying to grow, understanding your value is critical. Having, I think I heard some of that in what you said also, um, the ability to, to understand what you bring to the table and therefore stand in, in, in your power, so to speak, but doing it humbly, of course. Um, and I must say that uh, that was a defining moment for me. If anything, it certainly influenced the trajectory of my career in the bank. And I've always used that um, learning to help bring others up and to reach out to other people whether they were working for me or not. And it really influenced a lot of the decisions, the career decisions that I made in the bank and some of the risks I took or positions that I took on subsequently. So for me, the, the thing, I definitely agree about the humility. I definitely agree that you need to listen. Um, and um, certainly, uh, 
understanding your value is something that I think is really, really critical. I, I want to point out that, um, and, and granted it's been a, what, a couple of years, but these two honorees came with the printed out questions and extensive notes written all over them, I <laughs> which I don't know. Notes. Rita, I don't know if you did that. We, I feel like we were a little more uh, off the cuff. Um, but uh, I looked over at Margot's paper and I see written in big letters, do not settle. And I love that. I think that's such important advice and that, that combination of, you know, how do you walk that line of humility, but also knowing your value and standing in your power and not settling. Um, so brilliant, you know, and, and a challenge that both of these women have been navigating and will continue to navigate. So our last question, um, I'm kind of going to differentiate it a little bit for each of you. Um, have you had mentors and sponsors in your career? So we'll start with Margot. What are the differences between mentorship and sponsorship for you? And has mentorship changed now that we're in this era of Me Too and some of the concerns around that with mentoring? Um, so I definitely had mentors. And I would say the person who reached out to me in HR in the example that I gave certainly could be classified as a sponsor. What's the difference between the two? Invariably, a mentor is somebody who proffers advice, who shares their wisdom and their experience. Um, and I tend to think of it as a more, uh, a relationship that is really in sharing, sharing experience, knowledge, but hands off, much more hands off. A sponsor, uh, in my experience, is someone who has the ability to actually influence by using their, their social, political, and leadership capital to help another person in a particular situation, in a professional situation or in a social situation. Um, and if you think, think about it, that happens all the time. That's how societies are built. That's how they operate. You know, you, we know that, right? Um, or we think so. But it happens more often within certain class structures, within certain social structures. It's easier, invariably, I think, um, for that to happen among like-minded or among individuals who share a certain thinking or race or whatever, right? Um, I would like to say both are important both are useful. There's another side that I don't think, having served as mentor and sponsor and having benefited from mentorship and sponsorship, there's a side that I think we don't acknowledge enough, and that is both parties in that relationship stand to benefit. Uh, I found wonderful growth opportunities in myself by listening to other people who are seeking my advice. And it's an opportunity for learning, um, certainly for, for expanding outreach. So I feel that in mentoring relations, to, and I have many thousands, <laughs> um, I had opportunities to grow equally as I, I love to see those people growing as well. So it's mutually satisfactory um, and benef I shouldn't say satisfactory, beneficial, right? And the same thing with the sponsorships. Now, in today's world, especially since Me Too, and I should say we, it shouldn't be looked at solely from the perspective of, of um, gender, but I think what we have seen over the past 10 years or so is greater clarity about boundaries and the rules of the road. And perhaps making the contracting process clearer. I think we stand to benefit because when someone is seeking a mentor or a sponsor, they need to fully understand what they're asking for, what they're prepared to do, and where the limits are. 
and the same for the mentor and the sponsor. So I think, I hope that going forward, we will see a much clearer contracting process, greater transparency, and greater accountability on both sides. This is not an either or, it's not, you know, I think it's, it, the time is right and we, we really need to use our positions to help guide the people who are coming up or people who are entering into new spaces to understand that has to be a basic part of your toolkit. I would like to see business schools in the roles that you play, um, really integrating that into the instruction and the guidance that you give students. So I think two, two really important points. One is that there's a there's benefit for both the, the mentee and the mentor, the sponsored and the sponsorer. Um, and that the, the Me Too conversation has clarified some boundaries around both of those things. I want to uh, move to Audrey and a question of, you know, when do you know, how do you know when it's time to move from mentor or mentee, someone that's being mentored, to you're now the mentor? How, what was it clicked for you to realize that that had started to shift and you needed to move into a different role? Yeah, for me, I think um, that's something that I'm really passionate about, serving and um, mentoring and being a resource for the next generation of leaders. I think it's really vital for us to do that. Um, and honestly, I don't think there's like an age limit for you to be a mentor. Um, I think that you can start as a child if you want, right? Some of the best lessons I've learned is watching children and how they, they, they just are innocent and, and just do what they want. <laughs> um, and so I think that I think that you really can um, start if you're willing to be a mentor to um, individuals in your community. Um, for me, there were many individuals who poured into me when I was um, developing and growing. Um, they said, you know, gave me their time, resources, and invested in my ideas, and I think that for free at that. <laughs> and so I think I would be doing myself a disservice if I didn't do the same thing for other individuals as well. Um, and in fact, um, I had the opportunity, so I work for the Women's Business Enterprise National Council, and there we launched an um, uh, incubator, a women of color incubator, where we, um, where we taught individuals, black women in HBCUs, um, career readiness skills, but also like helping them get their business idea from just an idea to an actual venture. And the person who Marriott sponsored the Marriott sponsored the incubator, and so did Miss um, Janice Bryant Harroyd, who was the first Black woman to build a billion-dollar company. And as I had the opportunity to learn from her and some of the stories that she shared, she said that um, when she was growing up, she was living in Jim Crow era. And so uh, with her school, a lot of the books that they received were haggard, ripped out, all of that. And she had to figure out what was missing in between the pages. And she remembered um, speaking with her mom and her mom said, when you find out what was missing, right in between the lines, so that the person who's coming after you mm -hmm. won't have to go through the same pain point as you. And so in the same way I think of mentorship like that, I think that in the same way when you've learned, you know, your leadership style, for example, um, that, you know, <laughs> understanding what that looks like. The next, per the next leader coming up and to, to help them evaluate their leadership style and be a resource as well. A shameless plug. So in, in January, in June of this year, I've partnered with two uh, other um, entrepreneurs and we are launching a Young Leaders Mentorship Program where it's a three-pronged approach. We focus on self, brand, and network, um, and we're hands-on, kind of like what Margot was talking about, not just like telling you, hey, it's time for you to be watered, or hey, it's time for you to prune. We're actually there watering. Hey, we're actually here. They're, availing you to our network and helping you grow that way. And so, yes, I definitely think that mentorship is something that if more people do uh, more of, I think that will have more outstanding leaders. Excellent points. Yeah, the, the, the research literature is really clear on this, right? Because 
the leaders who actually empower those around them are the ones who are the most powerful. Mm -hmm. um, so, so Margo's really right. It does, it, you know, the power that we give to others it actually reflects back on us. So there is a benefit for us when we empower others. All right, so for those of you who haven't been to Smith Women Inspire or haven't been in a while, it's time for the famous lightning round. Um, so we're gonna ask some lightning round questions. Um, for my undergrads, I'm using Quizlet because it randomizes the questions. The I was telling Nicole, I didn't know Quizlet was this advanced. Yes, yeah, it's advanced. Like, I don't think we ever used Quizlet on my phone when I was in school, it's always on the computer. Quizlet has gone, uh, gone phone, phone, yeah. well, phone. It's all about the phone, all about the technology. All right. So um, pulling out my flashcards. All right, so you can pass. You can say pass and pass to the other one. Um, first question. In the last five years, what have you become better at saying no to? Distractions, invitations, um, any new realizations or approaches that have helped you say no? Uh, any tips for us in saying no more? So this is a quick answer. Uh, we'll start, let's see. Audrey, you're the last person to talk, so we'll go back to you. Audrey, you go first. Social media. Oh, saying no to social media. Okay, any tips for the rest of us in saying no? Um, have blocks where you don't go to, on social media. <laughs> okay. Blocks of like time during the day or like blocks like weeks? Well, I do both. Do both. <laughs> so like in the morning, <laughs> in the morning, um, like when I get up, you know, staying off social media and making sure I have that time for myself. And then also sometimes when it gets just taxing, I yeah. have, you know, I won't, I won't do social media for the week. All right, Margo, in the past five years, what have you become better at saying no to? Uh, invitations. I get, I get a lot of requests to speak and to do things, and um, I'm going to take a word from Audrey, self-care. Uh, you kind of have to learn to pace yourself. Uh, crazy travel schedules. I've traveled a lot for the last 30 years, but um, once I left the bank, uh, then I really learned, had to learn to manage that and to be able to turn things down. Well, we're grateful you said us. yes to us. <laughs> All right, next question. When you feel overwhelmed or unfocused or you've lost your focus temporarily, is there anything you do to kind of get yourself back focused? Marco? Sleep. <laughs> oh, I like it. <laughs> Audrey. So I take a personal retreat. Ah. So I did this last year, and I just started doing this, so it's not like something I've been doing forever. But um, I started doing this last year. I take like a week off and go to a really nice hotel and just chill and refocus. Nice. Um, I'm going to ask two more questions. Where is Mark? We're doing audience Q&A, too. So get, I'll just say that, and you can start to think about your questions. And then I will do two more questions, and we'll get some audience Q&A. Okay. Ooh, I like this one. This is my favorite. Uh, we'll, who did first last time? We'll start with Audrey. How would you spend an extra hour every day? Sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Margo. Uh, I've been sleeping longer. I really, nice. since the beginning of this year, I've really committed to eight, at least trying to do eight hours. So if I had an extra hour every day, I would really um, use it to um, be more meticulous, meticulous in planning mm. my next steps because that's, that's all part of it as well. Yeah. Um, uh, that's what I would do. I love that, that idea, like kind of future planning, like just that time to think. Mm -hmm. It's really powerful. All right. What's a recent non-career-related victory you have experienced? Margo. Non-career? Non-career-related victory, like a win but not at your job, a personal win. I can't think, I'm, I'm gonna pass, pass on that. The one that I think of is like, my sisters and I, so my sisters are here, and um, we did like Christmas games this year, oh. and it was like a Who Builds Christmas, we built like the whole set and everything, <laughs> and so um, that was really fun, spending time with, with family and doing all that, so. I found out how to bake cookies that have hearts in the middle. <laughs> like I figured out how to make like a cookie roll that has like hearts in the middle. Uh -huh. That's my personal win. So. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> okay, oh, and so, I, I, you want to so go can back? I give one yeah. now? Okay, so I, I used the pandemic to improve my baking skills. Ooh, mm. Perfect. So I never thought that I would bake bread. And I learned I, I'm really into making Japanese milk bread. <gasps> I encourage you to try it. Yes. Yeah. It comes with weight gain, though, so you've got to up the exercise. <laughs> well, 
But for me, that was a victory because I watched my mother as a child bake and I thought this was an incredible thing. Mm, but yeah. I never thought that I could do it. Yeah. And so that was a victory. That's a good one. All right, Mark, are we ready for audience questions? Yeah? Okay. So we have a couple of microphones set up. One here, is this the only one? Okay. I know it's a little nerve wracking, it's okay. <laughs> We're all socially awkward, it's fine. Please feel free to come up and ask a question. I know. It's on now, yeah. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. this is good. Well, thank you for coming. I was thinking of a question, so thank you for the the heads up, because at first I was blank just listening, and your stories are absolutely wonderful, but I'm a current second year graduating in May, and the president of the Women MBA Club in the community, so it's been actually progressively more important. It wasn't always my whole life, but one thing I do want to say is upon graduating in undergrad, I already experienced, you know, coming through adversity and being a woman in a male-dominated field, and post-graduation, I'll be in that field from more of a, a management standpoint, and that's something that's really important to me. But currently, I have this fire in me, and I want to keep it for 10 years going on, right? So how, my question to you is, how do you keep the fire in you for being, you know, driven, keeping to your goals? It's not necessarily how you stick to your goals, but how do you remind yourself and check in with yourself what's truly important and stick to your values? I think it's important that once you establish a vision, that part of working towards that vision is assessing how you're doing. So that in itself is helping you to take a look at where you are, where you want to go, what adjustments you need to make. And so it means keeping in touch with yourself. How, how am I developing? Am I getting the right skills? Is the vision right? Be prepared to and be courageous enough to change it if it doesn't work for you anymore. Um, and don't settle. <laughs> um, that that's, would be what I would offer. Do not settle. I got it. That is, that's something I have to remember leaving out of this, so I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, and, and for me, I would say, um, you know, in my head, I have 101 things to do and 101 places to be, but um, learning to write down what my vision is and, and where I want to be in the, in the next couple of years, um, kind of like what I said, I did a whole like personal retreat and I was intentional during that time to making sure that, you know, is it the trajectory that I want to be in, right? And taking that time to step back and like face myself um, was really important. And so having that periodically, I think that you'll be just fine. And also learning to just, li like, I also want my, like at the end of it all, I want to say I have lived, right? And so while doing my goals and, 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 and focusing on that, also having fun and making experiences um, along the way is important for me. Wonderful, thank you so much. Slogan or the billboard? Oh, the billboard, yeah. Okay. Um, so we're, we'll do a few more lightning round questions as you're thinking of some more questions you might want to ask. Um, so the next one, I think we, we're, we've, we've had a special request for the lightning round. If you had a gigantic billboard anywhere on it, metaphorically speaking, that could get a message out to millions of people, what would it say and why? Okay. I asked for that question because I also wanted to use this opportunity to help us um, recognize why we're doing this and why we're doing it in March. It's International Women's Month. So on that billboard, and there are lots of issues that we could pick up in this context, but there's one that I think that kind of falls off the radar. Um, on that billboard, I would place a slogan that says, equal pay, for work of equal value. And the reason why I would make that case is when you look at the gender pay gap, even in the United States across the board, on average, 
women make 83 cents on the dollar compared to men. But when you break that down into different groups and categories, it's absolutely astounding, the differences. So for example, Equal Pay Day um, this year will be April 12, 2022. But what it signifies is that on average, women will have to work all of 2021 until the middle of the fourth month of this year to catch up with the highest, with, with comparable wages, weekly wages for white males in the US. And last year, the equal pay day for Hispanic women was in October. This is a global phenomenon, and I would like for us and this in people in this room, as you go on in your careers and in your in managing and in leading and building businesses, to be a, be cognizant of this because it has real implications for society as a whole when you think of what women contribute to the economy and it's undervalued and underpaid. The pandemic has exacerbated these inequities, but it's at a detriment, not just for women, for all of us. I like to say these issues matter and we need male champions, but we also need to communicate clearly that this is about everybody's well-being at the end of the day. It also has important generational impacts because it means that poverty, the impact of poverty and deprivation on the coming generation gets passed on and it gets deeper. We're in a situation globally where roughly 100 males control the wealth equivalent of 70% of the rest of the world's populations. So I wanted to use this as a pitch because I, we, these are big issues, but you know, we each have a role to play in it. We each can do something about it. And if you think about it, when we talked about mentorship and sponsorship, you know, and how you grow your career, the admirable work that Audrey is doing as a social entrepreneur, which is what I take in your entrepreneurialism here. We have individual responsibility to do something, however little, um, in, our, in our family, in ourselves, in our lives, in our personal lives, but also through our networks. And then, of course, through the institutions with which we interact. So I wanted to use this as a pitch. It's an honor to be part of this discussion, but I think sometimes we have to look beyond um, the, the, the obvious and to recognize that we're at an inflection point in the world right now. Um, and a lot of the divisions that are, that are emerging globally is rooted in, in inequity and particularly economic inequity.
not 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 like being a like go make it a show per se, right? But 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 being a, an actual champion, right? Not only with your voice, but also with your resources, with your time, with your investment, um, and being in those rooms and being an advocate in that way. Um, I would say some of my best mentors and my favorite um, sponsors are older white men. Um, and so it's certainly like, in, you know, the networks that I've been able to, to, to participate in and, and, um, and forge relationships in those rooms, it wouldn't have been available if it, I didn't have those champions. And so um, to answer your question, Ashley, I'll just say be a champion um, for, for the individuals who, who, who need it. If I may add, because I think, I think you've certainly hit on something there. I think the best thing that we all can do, regardless of your color or who you are, is to really come to grips with the, with the fundamental principle that we're all equal. No matter what we look like, we're all, just, we're all equal. We're human beings in our own right. And if we start with that, and we start with respect for ourselves, and therefore recognizing we need to respect the other, then I think a lot of the other things come. Um, I learned that because I grew up in a multi-ethnic society. I, I was the first black child in the school. Um, at the age of four, that was the, the school was for expatriates, and you know, um, and it's that. If my parents didn't give me anything else, was that rooted understanding that I am who I am because I am. And I think if we can each start from that, then it becomes a lot easier to see or to answer the question: What is it that I must do? And and to me, that's a fundamental starting point that can then allow us to take, to take the steps that are needed to really make a difference. The other point is, it doesn't have to be the big things, mm -hmm. right? And so we stand up for each other. Then it's mutual. It's mutual vulnerability and it's mutual benefits. Um, that I think will pull us through in a way that we're more cohesive, we're stronger together, because we recognize the value in each other. So on the issue of, I raised the issue of equal pay. When, if you're in a, in a leadership position and you're about to hire someone, if you start from that, per, that perspective, then when it comes to re remuneration of the individuals, you're more likely to be able to say, what's driving a decision or a system that allows the pay for two people equally qualified to be so different and to challenge that. Or something else that I learned, just making sure that people get paid. There are people who sit, you know, you have to approve paychecks. I learned that very early. And they just sit on it. Think of the human, the human being on the other side. They're not less than you, same as you, right? So it, to me, I think as, as, as people and as societies, whatever capacity, we really need to go back to that fundamental, that assertion of the value of every human being. And if, if we, each of us could walk out of here tonight thinking about it, and maybe tomorrow when you wake up, you will really do something about it in that small way. Say something to somebody. If you have a child, communicate that, whatever it takes. But it's like, in my view, it's like diamonds in bright light, because from that little, the facet of the diamond, it can shine. Thank you so much, that was amazing. Hello, hi. Um, thank you guys again for coming out. Your stories are really inspiring and motivating. I'm Muna, I'm a senior here at Smith, graduating also in May. Um, I had two questions actually, one for you, Audrey, and one for you, Margot, but both of you guys can answer as well. Um, so for the first question for Audrey, um, I guess, what would you tell yourself as 
going back to when you were a recent grad, uh, like the biggest advice you would give back to yourself is, I need, I need some advice. <laughs> I would say for me, keep your notes because in class, like there were so many things that I learned and I just wish I kept my textbooks <laughs> and my notes and all of that. And so I would say do that. And also um, during your time at Smith, you'll have many opportunities. And even after, call, um, after you graduate, you'll meet great individuals and forge relationships. And sometimes um, I dropped the ball on this a couple of times, not following up. Um, I, you know, we had the relationship, but it just ended there and I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't follow up. And so I would say that would be, that would be mine. Keep your notes so that you can refer to them later on and also, um, follow up, like forge relationships and authentically too, right? It's not performative, but have a genuine interest to learn about people and, and, and also experience different things. So that would be my advice. Thank you. Thankful, thankfully to Google Docs, I can I can keep my notes. But definitely about the, the, the relationships. Yeah, I definitely I agree, especially with the like authenticity and maintaining that mm -hmm. and making sure that like your relationships have a purpose, but also like you know you're genuinely yes. interested in what people have to say. I think exactly. Definitely, that's that's valid. Also, and for you, Margo, um, the question I have, I guess, as someone that has a, like very vast background, a lot of experiences. Um, I guess, kind of, have you experienced like imposter syndrome, especially being a woman, um, a black woman at that too, um, it, like dealing with imposter syndrome? And if you have experienced that, how have you like navigated through it? Um, and kind of like, what are your tips and advice? Fake it till you make it. <laughs> <laughs> As Rihanna um, said. <laughs> um, look, you know, we got, we've got these catchphrases. And I think the, the the big thing is being in touch with yourself and trying to be clear about where it is you see the challenge. We, you know, when you look in the mirror, you don't really want to admit that I don't feel as confident. It's, imposter syndrome is a version of that, right? What I encourage you to do is always stay in touch with yourself, but be take note and value what you know. So that when you engage in those situations where you feel challenged, you can then be very um, transactional. What, this is what I know. This is what I don't know. In this situation, maybe I could learn something, but I will look for the opportunity to show what I know and what I can contribute. So you make it transactional. That takes away a lot of the uncertainty and the you know, um, the reticence, right? And it gives you the confidence because you know, I know something. And therefore, if I'm asked the question or if I have to speak, I will focus on what I know. I will be honest about what I don't know so then I can ask an interesting question. If you root it in that, then it helps to take some of the emotion out, you know? I think that's what's worked for me. And, but I've had people counsel me, um, on that, and that's what I would pass on to you. Solid advice, thank you both. All right. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. One more question. I always say that in my class, and then no one comes up, but oh, here we go. All right. Oh, we got to, that's fine, you can get both of you. <laughs> go ahead. Hi, every, thanks. I'll echo everybody's thanks. Um, Valerie Gubo, EMBA, just graduated from last summer. It's great to be out of it, let me tell you what. Um, so my as I'm, you know, not a, at 40, but I'm, I'll be approaching my 40s very soon. And I, you know, I'm facing a time in my life when I know I'm going to have to be making sacrifices and really understanding the trade-offs between career choices and personal life choices and you know, things get complicated with family and everything. So um, I'm curious to hear about some of the things that you all would consider sacrifices that you've made and just your reflections on the outcomes of those sacrifices. Like I said, a little, a little dark, sorry. <laughs> but thank you for your sincere answers. I appreciate it. I can, I can go for this one. Um, 
for me, as I was, and I would say it was somewhat of a sacrifice, so um, with the different opportunities that I was provided with, um, you know, and, and great opportunities, I never really got the opportunity to um, experience the wins with my family. Um, I always get nervous with my family, especially my sisters, because they're my biggest critics. <laughs> and so they are, they'll tell me as it is. And so I never really had the opportunity to invite them to any of my um, events. And as a result of, you know, um, all the other things that I had, that I did, I missed a lot of like family um, events and all of that. Um, and so that was a sacrifice that I, that I, I experienced earlier on. However, now I'm being very intentional about you know, spending time with my family and including them in opportunities like this. So they're here today um, <laughs> because I want to make sure that we experience these together. And also, like, spending time with your family, I think that is one of the things that, you can, I, for me, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a sacrifice that was worth it because those experiences um, that I got to, you know, spending time with my family and doing all the things that we did, um, together, that that is important to me. So I would say that that, that was the sacrifice that I uh, made. For me, in terms of sacrifice, I, I, again, I see it in terms of family. I I was asked to um, to move to to Europe at a time when my mother was getting, my parents were getting older. Um, I spent six years living in in Serbia. It, it, it was wonderful, but that was a personal sacrifice. To me, it was time, time lost. I moved back. Um, I, I demanded to come back uh, to six years. It, but I, I, professionally, it was a phenomenal opportunity. And I, I traveled a lot, excessively, uh, for most of my career. But when you physically remove yourself from one continent to the other, that adds another dimension for those relationships. And that's time lost that you can't regain. Um, unfortunately, in today's world, some of those demands are made. And in retrospect, it's nice to have options. <laughs> want to bring Mark up next to, we're going to have a, a quick honor of our guests, I think. Right. Yeah. So while we're getting uh, ready, I just want to thank Margo, Dr. Margo Thomas and Audrey Watson. This is incredible. Thanks to the students who asked uh, and Rita and alums who've asked their questions. And I'll pass it off to Mark to close us out for this evening. Thank you, Nicole. And thank you to Margo and Audrey. Great conversations as always. It started with our other videos last week, so I'm glad to continue to hear the rest of it. Um, so thank, many thanks to all of you for your discussion, for the time with us this evening. And so many key nuggets of wisdom were shared, like I just said. Um, and I look forward to learning more and getting to know you both better. Uh, so I'd like to invite Dean Kanana back to the stage, and we will officially thank you and present you with a token of our appreciation. It's the best part. These things are awesome. Thank you, Dean Kanana. I think I saw Kristen Welch come in. Did I see? There she is. Our 2013 honoree, thank you for joining us. Um, so this concludes our conversation portion for the evening for this year's Women Inspire. Please join us for the networking reception in the hallway, um, and we'll see you next year. Um, I do have three things I want you to do before, before you leave tonight. There is a homework assignment. Um, I'm not a teacher, but I do ask questions sometimes. Um, one is to please remember to visit our information tables for the departments and student orgs that came in uh, to learn more about them. 
Two is to meet at least one new person that you did not come here with. If you haven't done that yet, you still have some work. And third, three is to grab one of your parting gifts in Reaver Hall uh, when you leave. So it's three simple things to do, and that's all I'm asking. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it.